The title of the message today is, Do Not Sorrow, The Joy of the Lord is Your Strength. Nehemiah 8, if you'd stand with me for the reading of the word. This first passage actually is why we do stand for partial parts of reading the word of God. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, For he was standing above the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. These people had a great reverence for the word of God. When Ezra opened the book of the law to read it, they all stood in respect. Verse 6 says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Great God, the people lifted up their hands in worship and cried, Amen. Amen. Listen, it's acceptable to lift up your hands in worship and say Amen at the word of God. (laughs) I won't be offended if you shout Amen while I'm preaching. It says, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 8 says, and so they, or the Levites, read distinctly from the book in the law of God. And they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. A truly effective minister will help you understand the word of God. They will give you the sense and the meaning, the clarity of the scriptures. Verse 9, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Verse 10, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to whom, to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can be seated. Verse 9 says that, Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites, as they were speaking the word distinctly and teaching the people and giving them the understanding of the scriptures, they noticed the people starting to weep and starting to mourn and starting to grieve. And as they were doing that, Ezra said, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. This people reminds me of young King Josiah when he heard the words of the book of the law which had been lost for years. See, they were, they were trying to repair the temple and they were cleaning the temple and Hilkiah the priest found the word of God. He found the book of the law which had been lost for many years. And God had been stirring Josiah's heart. He had been cleansing the land from idolatry and, and, and having a Passover. And now they found the book of the law. And it says, the scribe brought it before Josiah at his command. And when they read the word of God to Josiah, it says that he wept and he tore his clothes and he grieved before God because he saw how far they had wandered from God. And he knew that God was going to bring judgment on the nation of Israel. And The Bible says that he he sent word to a prophetess to find out what God would do. And the word came back and said, because your heart was tender before me and you wept, you responded to my word. I'm going to restrain this judgment until after you die. You're going to have peace in your times. But when the word of God came to Josiah, he wept. And when the word of God came to these people in Nehemiah's day and Ezra's day, when they were rebuilding the walls of the temple and rebuilding the temple, the people heard the word of God and they were grieved. They were cut to the heart and and they were smitten and they were sorrowful. They were mourning. Sometimes the word of God comes to us and it it cuts us and it, it convicts us and it makes us grieve. But my friend, that is not the normal state of the believer. God does not want his people to be always grieving. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to weep. James said it. In chapter 4, he said, weep and mourn, you friends of the world, you double-minded, turn your laughter into sorrow and your joy into gloom. There's a time for the sinner to repent and be sorrowful for their sin and come back to God. 
But God doesn't leave us in sorrow. God doesn't leave us in grief. God wants his people to be a joy-filled people, a glad people. And Ezra said, and the priest said to the people, don't mourn, don't grieve. This day is holy to the Lord. He said, go your way, eat the fat, eat the good stuff, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow. Don't stay in a state of grief. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Glory to God. There's a time to fast and there's a time to deny yourself and there's a time to pray and there's a time to eat the fat and drink the sweet. I want to see people coming to this altar and I, I want to see people mourn over their sin. But I want to also see people not mourning over their sin every time they come to the altar. I want to see people rejoicing. I want to see people's faces radiant. I want to see, see people saying, my God is a God who gives me joy. Because God didn't save us to make us gloomy Christians. He's given us the greatest things in the, in the world, in the universe to rejoice in. Praise God. The joy of the Lord. Joy means rejoicing. It comes from another Hebrew word, which means to rejoice. And it means gladness or joy. The joy of the Lord or the joy of Jehovah, the joy of Yahweh is your strength. The joy that comes from God. You see, true Christianity is something that produces joy. It doesn't produce somber faces and sad people and religious critical people walking around with their nose in the air and pointing at everyone else. It produces a life that overflows with joy. It says the joy of the Lord is your strength. That Hebrew word means a place or means of safety, protection, a refuge or a stronghold, a harbor or a rock. God wants his joy to be a fortress for us, a defense in times of fear, in times of trouble. He wants us to be filled with confidence and joy in him and peace through his Holy Spirit. Nehemiah 8, 11, and 12 says, So the Levites quieted or stilled all the people who were weeping, saying, Be still or stop grieving. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. It says they rejoiced greatly. The joy came into them. Why? Because when they heard the word of God, they understood it. They understood the words that were declared to them. This is significant. God giving them understanding was proof that he loved them and he was for them not against them. Listen, when you read the word of God or you hear it preached and you understand it, rejoice, be joyful. That is God's favor on you, that he's opened your heart to know him. He's taken away that veil of, of blindness and given you sight to see him, to understand his word. That's his favor. That's his goodness. That's proof that he loves you. Because, friends, the world is blind to the truths of God. They can read the Bible and they can sit in a service and say, boy, that, that preacher sure got excited. I don't know what he was excited about. But that's because they can't see. And so if you can see and you can understand, rejoice like they did in Nehemiah's day. Rejoice that God's talking to you, that God's speaking to you. It proves that he loves you, he favors you. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, your words were found and I ate them. See, the words to Jeremiah were more than just doctrinal truths. They were life. They were sustenance. They were bread. It says, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. When you hear God's word and you understand it, doesn't it bring you joy? Doesn't it make your heart say, God, this is amazing. What you're showing me about Jesus, this isn't dead religion, this is life. Luke 24, 32. Remember the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. When, they, when Jesus walked with them after the resurrection, they said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked 
with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. This was a good burning. This was joy burning in their hearts as Jesus opened the scriptures about himself. Friends, we are living in stressful and fearful times. But I believe that God is going to keep his people in a fortress called joy. He's going to give us the joy of his strength as a defense against the flood of evil. This shelter of joy is going to make us shine as stars in the midst of a generation overwhelmed by darkness and fear. People's hearts are going to fail them for fear of what's coming on the earth. That's what Jesus said. But his people are going to be rejoicing in God as their shelter from the storm. Psalm 1611 says, in your presence is what? Fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is going to be comforting his people again and again and again in the coming days. Isn't that encouraging? He's going to be comforting us because he's the God of all comfort. And he knows that we, his people, in troubled times, need comfort. We need his strength. We need his joy. I believe that the Lord is calling his people back to a simplicity in faith. He's calling us to simply believe him, listen to his voice, and follow what he says. Matthew 17, 5, the transfiguration, the, the very few times that the Father spoke and it was recorded, he spoke from heaven and he said over Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him, hear him, listen to him. He's going to speak. He's a speaking Christ. He's a risen Christ. He's a speaking savior. Hear him. That's simple, isn't it? I believe the last day's church, the call to us is simple. It's hear him. We have a living word. All we need to do is believe in Jesus, then listen for his voice and obey what he's saying. This will bring us joy and, and peace that overcomes the darkness and the fear of our age. Romans 15, 11. If this isn't highlighted in your Bible, get out your highlighter or mark it so you can highlight it later. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friend, there's something that happens when you truly believe in Jesus. He fills you. The Holy Spirit fills you with all joy and peace in believing. So you abound in hope through the power of his Spirit. Glory to God. God wants to fill his people with all joy and peace in believing. The restless religious are always looking for what to do for God. Remember what they said to Jesus, what good work shall we do that we might, you know, fulfill what God wants us to? And he said, this is the work of God. John 6, 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Believe in Christ. There's a simplicity to this walk with God. There's a simplicity. Sometimes we get all worked up and all the information around us and all the study and all these things and the Lord's just saying, will you just come to me and believe in me? Will you just come and put your trust in me? I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to show you what to do in troubled times. I'm going to show you how to hide in me and find your joy renewed, your strength renewed. Jesus said that only one thing is needful to Mary or to Martha. You remember what that was? Mary showed us that the one needful thing was choosing to sit at Jesus' feet to hear his word. One thing is needful. Mary chose it to sit at Jesus' feet and hear his word. He's going to speak peace to his children. He's going to be comforting us. He's going to renew our joy. Jesus didn't say if we believed and followed him that all our circumstances would marvelously, miraculously improve and then, then we could have peace because our circumstances were better. Our situation was improved. 
No, he said, there's going to be some rough seas ahead. But my words and my presence will give you peace that passes understanding in the storms. John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Be of good courage. Be joyful. Because I've overcome the world. Listen, we have peace not only because what he speaks to us, but because we are in him and he is in us. He said that in me, you may have peace. Jesus is not an ideology. He's not a religious system. He's a person. And when we trust in Christ, he places us in himself and all the blessings of Christ come to us. Praise God. These things I have spoken to you that you that in me you may have peace. In spite of the rough seas of life, and we will all pass through rough waters, in spite of the rough seas of life, we can have joyful courage because he has overcome the world. He's overcome every trial that you will walk through. He's already overcome it. And so when you're resting in him, he's going to give you his peace because he's victor. Praise God. One of the most amazing things about the joy of the Lord is that it actually abounds or flourishes in tribulation. The more prosperity the church has, the less joy they have. The more suffering and trials, the greater the church's supernatural joy and peace. Why is that? Because trials cast us on Jesus. Trials turn our eyes back to him and say, Lord, I need you. But when we're in prosperity, we're kind of going to sleep and we're saying, I got it pretty good. And we just forget about Jesus. He's the source of our joy. He's the source of our peace. Amen? This joy is only released by faith in Jesus. Not a general faith like, ah, yeah, I believe Jesus is the son of God. Well, good. Not just a saving faith in Jesus. That will give you joy. If you're not saved and you repent of your sins and believe on Christ, you will experience the joy of the Lord. Him lifting your sins and your burdens and washing you and putting your name in the book of life. He will give you joy. But sometimes in Christianity, we go around and we just think, well, I've been saved a long time. And I, yeah, I believe that about Jesus. And I believe this and X and Y about Jesus. That's not the kind of faith that connects you to his joy. It's looking in the eyes of Jesus Christ and saying, Jesus, I trust you. I believe in you. I'm following you. Not as a doctrine, but as a person. It's only when your eyes lock on his that the joy bursts out. Peter had peace in the storm and walked above it all when his eyes were transfixed on Jesus' eyes. You know what happened when he looked away at the waves, right? Bloop, sinking down. Lord, save me. Okay, Peter, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to do that again and again. You can take your eyes off me and I'll keep rescuing you. You keep crying out to me. I'm going to keep pulling you up, but I'm going to train you little by little to keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. First Peter 6, uh, 1, I'm sorry, 6 through 8. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved or are in heaviness by various trials. Listen, all of us are going to be grieved and and experience heaviness at different times in our lives through various trials. Look at what he says in verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your tribulation and trials are not happenstance. They're not a mistake. They're part of God's plan to refine your faith so that it brings God glory and praise on the day that we meet him. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Speaking of Jesus, he says, whom having not seen, you love. You love this Christ that you never set eyes on. Peter had seen him, walked with him for three years. But he said to these disciples, he said, you've not seen him, but you love him. Though now you do not see him yet, listen, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Glory to God. 
Think of the joy that the disciples had when they saw Christ risen from the dead come and walk through a wall and stand in their presence. Think of that joy. But my friend Peter says here that you going through these trials and heaviness and tribulation, you love Jesus even though you haven't seen him. And though you don't see him, when you're putting your trust in him, you're believing on him, you're locking eyes with him, it's as yet believing you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. My friend, that's for us. That's for today. As we believe him in the simplicity of faith in Jesus Christ, he gives us joy in our trials, inexpressible, overflowing and full of glory. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Listen, religion can't do that. Dead religion can't do that. But relationship with Jesus Christ does that. The harder things get, it presses us to look to Jesus. And when we believe on him, he pours out joy. He pours out joy and strength that's a refuge for us. Hallelujah. Listen, I know that many of you are praying for those in, in Palestine and in, in Gaza and for Israel and you're praying for safety and it, and it feels like, oh God, this is just such a mess and there's war and there's bombs and there's people dying. But I want to tell you something, that God will save people in the midst of these tribulations. God will save people in the midst of these trials because God is still in control even in the midst of trials. The gospel will be shared and people's hearts will be more tender to receive it in fear for their life because of what they're under than many Americans are today. Than many Americans sitting comfortably here in Elm Grove and Brookfield and New Berlin who have everything they need and on a Sunday morning they're just kicking back. The gospel of Jesus Christ can be more effective when there's tribulation than when there's prosperity. So pray, pray that the word gets out because people will be receptive for hope of the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 7, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, listen, having received the word in much affliction. These Thessalonian believers received the word when? When they were going through a really tough time. They received the word in much affliction, but what? With joy of the Holy Spirit. With joy of the Holy Spirit. Someone's going through a really hard time in life. You say, oh, it's not the right time to share the gospel. No, it's the perfect time to share the gospel. It's the perfect time because God is softening their heart. God is preparing them through afflictions to receive the word of God in spite of their circumstances, and it will come into their life with joy in the Holy Spirit. Praise God. The gospel prospers in hard times. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. I want to remind you of a few more reasons to rejoice and to be of good cheer. I mean, we got way too many for me to cover in one sermon, but I'm going to give you just some. A few. Matthew 9, 2 says, And behold, they brought to him or to Jesus a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Before the man was healed, Jesus said, Be of good courage, be happy, be joyful. Why? Because something greater than having your body healed is happening. And that's your sins being forgiven. He said, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Listen, Jesus' blood has washed us white as snow. Goodbye guilt. Goodbye shame. Hello peace. Hello love. Hello joy. Praise God. Do, does the blood of Jesus still thrill you? Do you say, God, thank you that I'm washed, that I'm cleansed, that I don't have shame anymore, that I'm free because you've washed me from my past sins and you continue to wash me from my present sins and you'll wash me from my future failures. Praise God. Be glad. Rejoice. Your sins are forgiven you. Luke 10, 20. Nevertheless, he said, do not rejoice in this. He's talking to his disciples that the spirits or the demons are subject to you. 
I mean, that's pretty cool if, you, if demons are, are obeying and coming out of people and, and you've got this authority and power and they're like, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. He said, don't rejoice in that. But rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Praise God. We're, we're not going to an eternity of suffering in hell. We are going into everlasting joy in Jesus. That's exciting. That should bring you joy. He's transferred you from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness into light. Praise God. He said, don't rejoice in power or authority. Rejoice that your names are in heaven, and that's where you're going. Praise God. Praise God. Matthew 14, 27, but straightway, that these are all be of good cheer sayings of Jesus, but straightway Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. This is when Jesus walked to the disciples, they were on the boat on, on the Sea of Galilee and it was a storm and Jesus had been praying and he walked, he walked, he was watching them and he walked past them and they saw him and they all were terrified because they, they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus sees them, they cry out and this is what he says, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Jesus was with them in their storm. He was watching them and he was waiting for them to cry out. He was waiting for their invitation to come in and to be their peace. Listen, when you're going through something and the enemy says, where is God? You've been praying about this. You've been in the storm a while. Where is God? Jesus is very near. He is watching. And he says, be of good cheer. I'm right here. Don't be afraid. Don't give in to fear. Isaiah 41, 9. The Lord really spoke to me from this passage this week. He says, you are my servant. This is the end of the verse. You are my servant and I have chosen you and not cast you away. I've chosen you and not cast you away. Have any of you ever wrestled with a fear that God was going to forsake you? Or that God was just going to say, I've, re I've dealt with your sin and your inconsistency and you're going back to some of these old things for so long. I'm just so tired of you. I'm done. I have. But he says, I've chosen you and not cast you away. Rejoice. Be joyful. God will not cast you away. He is the God of acceptance, not rejection. He's the God that says you're accepted in the beloved. I've chosen you, I've called you, and I'm going to keep you. Remember what he said? He said, no one can snatch my sheep out of my hand. They're in my hand, they're in my father's hand, and no one can snatch you out. You're in my hand. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I've chosen you and I've not cast you away. Hebrews 13, five and six says, for he himself has said, I'm going to start at the beginning of the verse. Let your conduct or your life be without covetousness. Covetousness is just a constant desire to fill yourself with something you think will make you happy. Saying, I got to have that thing, that relationship, that purchase, that thing. What is it that's got to make me happy? He says, don't live that way thinking like something else is going to make you happy. He said, be content with such things as you have. Why? For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I'm not walking out on you. I am not that, that spouse that walked out on you. I am not that person that failed you. I'm not that dad that left you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Rejoice. Be joyful. Be glad. This is the Christ we serve. Praise God. Praise God. So we may boldly say, verse 6, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me and said, he'll never leave me. He's walking with me, through me, overcoming everything I go through. Why should I be afraid? No. Hallelujah. The Lord is my helper who will never leave me or abandon me. That produces joy. Praise God. Isaiah 41.10, listen to this. Fear not, for I am with you. I haven't left you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. That's God saying, I'm committed to you. Don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. I'm with you, and I'm your God. 
I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Praise God. That's a shelter, that's strength, that's joy in a time. In every, everything that we face in life, life or death, trouble or hardship, riches or poverty, that's joy. God says, I'm your God. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. I'll uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Verse 13 in Isaiah 41 says, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand saying to you, fear not, I will help you. Hallelujah. I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying, fear not, I will help you. Praise God. God says, I'm upholding you with the right hand of my righteousness, and I'm holding your hand with my hand. He says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I won't forsake you. I won't turn away from you. I'm going to help you. We're going to get through this together because I'm your God. Praise God. Another passage says, underneath are the everlasting arms. So God's got us in his hand. God's upholding us with his hand. He's holding our hand and underneath are his arms. I think that's really secure. I think that's a place of safety that we can rest in and we can rejoice in. Praise God. Acts 23, 11. Here's another be of good cheer. It says, and the night following, the Lord stood by him or by Paul and said, be of good cheer, Paul. He was facing a lot of difficulties at that time and God, and Jesus spoke to him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for you, as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so must you also bear witness at Rome. What was he saying to Paul? He's saying, Paul, I'm not done with you. It looks really tough right now. It looks really hard right now, but I've got more work for you to do. I've got more gospel for you to proclaim. I've got more people for you to testify of what I've done in your life. I want to encourage you today. He's not done with you. He has more work that he's planned and prepared in advance for you to do. He has more for you to do. God doesn't quit on us, guys. He doesn't quit on his people. And he says, don't quit on me. Don't turn away in unbelief. Don't stop believing in me. Keep believing. And my joy is going to be coming out of your life. It's going to be poured into your life. It's going to push out the fear and the darkness. Hallelujah. Listen, I want to speak to those of you who've been going through a painful season and where it seems like nothing is in your favor. I want to encourage you to let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Listen to what Habakkuk said in in chapter 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. He says, everything is barren. There's no flowering. There's no animals. Everything seems hopeless in the natural. He says in this, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Hallelujah. God is encouraging you to come out of grieving and to come into his joy. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter if there's no flowers, there's no animals in the stall, it doesn't see the, the it looks everything looks gray, everything looks barren. Listen to what Habakkuk said. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'm choosing to praise my God. I'm choosing to worship him. I'm choosing to be joyful in the God of my salvation. Hallelujah. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night or a season, but joy comes in the morning. I want to encourage you, dear child of God, you may be going through a season of weeping. You may be going through a season of barrenness, but God says, Joy will come. There is a dawning. There is a morning. Not a morning of sadness, but a morning of brightness. Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, will rise with healing in his wings, and he will bring you joy. 
He is the source of our joy. Praise God. You've wept long enough. The night has passed. It's time to renew your joy. Don't stay or settle in this state of sorrow. Did you know it can become comfortable sometimes in a place of grieving or even a place of depression or self-pity? It can become normal and it can become a place you just kind of, you're so used to it. You're just like, I've, I've been here so long. I've been complaining about this, but Jesus is saying, it's time to come out. <laughs> It's time to come out. It's time to to stop mourning and start rejoicing in who I am. It's time for my joy to lift you up into a new place of strength. Don't stay there. Don't stay there. He's calling you forward. He's calling you out. He's calling you up. Praise God. I want to just repeat what I read earlier. Whom having not seen you love, though now you don't see him or Jesus yet believing, You rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Philippians 3.1, my last verses. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the things, the same thing to you is not tedious. It's It's not wearing me out, but for you it's a safeguard. What's a safeguard? That you rejoice in the Lord that you joy in the God of your salvation no matter what your circumstances are, that you believe on this Christ who is risen from the dead, slain for our sins, risen from the dead to give us the hope of eternal life. He says, believe on me and my joy is gonna return to your life. Amen? I wanna invite you to come up to this altar to pray and to ask God, if, this, if, if God spoke to you and just, you're in a place, you're like, I've been in a place of pain. I've been in a place of sorrow. I've been in a place of depression. I've been in a place where I've lost my joy. And you want to renew your joy in the Lord. Let's come to this altar together and ask the Lord to renew our joy. He doesn't want us, listen, he doesn't want us worshiping like this all the time. He wants us worshiping like this. Thank you, God. I rejoice in you. I rejoice in you. Sorrow, grief, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming. Joy is coming. He's the glory. He's the lifter of our heads. And he has joy for his children as we trust them. Amen.